Hey everyone. Oh, it's so nice to see all these beautiful faces this morning. Everyone like really dressed well today. I'm impressed. <laughs> I want to talk to you this morning about Creative Morning's theme, Genius. And I don't really think that um, I want to focus on any one genius, but rather our collective genius. I think that we often focus on this idea of the lone genius, this like tortured soul who stays up late in a laboratory or studio by their self and without the input or help of anyone from their community or any of their relationships. And I kind of think that that's bogus. I think we are all geniuses and um, the term genius actually came uh, to, to describe this inherent gift that, you know, the, the Romans thought that we were all given by gods, um, which is we were all filled with a genius and not necessarily that we were geniuses. And I think that that's a lot more compelling than this idea that there are only genius people. So I want to just go through a few different examples of the ways in which we as people connect with each other, with our networks, with our partners and um, our muses, and tap into our own geniuses together. So the first kind of creative pairing that uh, I want to talk about is dreamers and doers. And I promise this is going to be the only time that I talk about tech in this, uh, in this presentation. Uh, when we think of dreamers and doers, I think maybe one of the most iconic duos we have is uh, John Lennon and Paul McCartney. You know, they're pretty much um, the epitome of this like kind of wild creative one and the partner that can wrangle it all together and package it and present it to the world. Uh, you know, John Lennon was notoriously, you know, hippy-dippy and uh, always, you know, had these really outlandish ideas. And Paul McCartney was the one to kind of wrangle it together and make something really marketable and presentable. And because of their combined genius, we have the Beatles. And, you know, there are a few other people in there too, but <laughs> <they're>, <laughs> they kind of steal the show, I think. Um, and I think the way that I interact with this kind of dynamic in my everyday life is my day job as a product designer. You know, I definitely fill the, the John Lennon role of being like totally out there. And I think a lot of, you know, experienced designers or product designers are kind of the same way. We want to reach for the stars and do something like really wild and crazy. And we have product managers <laughs> as the people to wrangle us down to earth and say, okay, what are we actually doing now? <laughs> and um, that I think has led to a lot of Obviously, any app that we have today that's out there is the product of a really good pairing of a product designer and a project manager. And very rarely can you do both. If you can, talk to me afterwards. Uh, the next kind of creative genius pairing I want to talk about is the idea of, you know, this kind of problem child that's really glorified as, as, its, as its own sort of genius and what I actually think is happening, or what is happening behind the scenes, is there's someone that's enabling that sort of like tortured, artistic soul. And who we have up here is Alexander McQueen, famous fashion designer who uh, is no longer with us, and his creative partner, Isabella Blow. And the way that they worked together was uh, really uh, uh, dramatic. So Isabella Blow is this, uh, she was an heiress and she just wanted to fund these crazy artistic types and to fuel her kind of love of crazy nightlife and Alexander McQueen was just the type of person that she was looking for to, uh, to kind of fund in their tortured, uh, in their tortured uh, artistic explorations and what we got out of that uh, out of this dynamic was some of the most beautiful uh, couture gowns that we have in modern times. A, a couple years ago, there was an exhibit at the Met Costume Institute uh, with Alexander McQueen's stuff on exhibit, and so much of it was from Isabella Blow's 
actual our, uh, her estate because she was the one that was funding him and encouraging him and some might even say helping drive the mania that drove him and this is kind of a hard it's a hard uh, relationship to to maintain and uh, it, it can drive the, this being the like problem child and being enabled by someone is obviously so filled with drama and I hope no one is dealing with that right now, but it can, it can really produce some out of this world uh, genius. So the next one I wanna talk about is the artist and the muse. And this is kind of one of these like very tried and true artistic stereotypes of the artist and who inspires them, who gives them what they need to create or spurs any artistic uh, projects that they have. And so who you'll see up here is uh, the famous ballet uh, director, Balanchine, and his muse, Suzanne Farrell. And this is such an interesting dynamic to have between two creative types because one is almost, I don't want to say exploiting another, but it's definitely kind of pushing this boundary of, you know, at what point does uh, taking, you know, the artistic inspiration from one person just turn into stealing or, you know, exploitation. And the result of their, um, of their artistic dynamic was, uh, it kind of exploded to the point where she, you know, fell out of favor with him and it effectively ended her career, which is so, so tragic. Um, but, and then of course we only really remember Balanchine as the genius and we so rarely give credit to the muse which inspired him. The next thing I want to talk about is the, the interplay of rivals when it comes to two kind of genius ideas. I think that, I don't know, how many of you guys went to art school? Okay, a few, a few. Maybe this is true in other, in other majors too, but did you guys ever feel this need to just be better, be more creative than everyone else at school? <laughs> I definitely did, and I was such an asshole about it. And <laughs> I only recognize now that like it was totally not cool to be that way, but the, the dynamic of seeing someone else as like a threat, as a competitor, can really drive your own genius to, to work a little extra harder, to put a little bit more effort into what you're doing. And I, I think I probably alienated a lot of people at my own art school by just being too competitive and maybe a lot of you feel the same way, but it's, it's, it's a, what's so interesting is I think that I would not be as, um, I would not have the work ethic that I do today if it were not for being driven by the work ethics of others. And when it comes to like how these two roles interact, it's, you wouldn't think of them as like a creative pairing, but and so often I think you're driven to do something different or something better or something more just because you're afraid that someone else might do something better than you. And God forbid that you, you know, come in second. I don't know anything about sports, but I know that this is a sports <laughs> analogy, so <laughs> please forgive me. <laughs> they have really cool jerseys, though, and I might watch basketball if they still played in these. So if anyone works at the NBA, let them know. Uh, the, the idea of being a loner, of being this like kind of lone genius is, I think, really attractive to people because we don't want to give credit where credit is due, or we might refuse to acknowledge the sources from which we draw inspiration. And I think one of the most famous loners in all of history is Emily Dickinson. And this is her family on the other side of you. Didn't know, because who would know? But 
she she was actually not quite the loner that we assumed she she was. She maintained this like really lengthy uh, back and forth with critics of her brothers and sisters, her um, her partners and other people in her social circle. She wouldn't necessarily go and get coffee with them, of course, but these correspondence, these letters were actively seeking uh, criticism and actively seeking input. And from that, I think her work was improved greatly. So it's interesting that we think of her as being completely shut off from the world when in fact she has some of the most detailed records of how she drew inspiration from what and how her critics and her supporters helped form her opinions and helped you know, hone her craft. And so with this, I think when, when you have this urge to not let anyone into your creative process or not let anyone into the, uh, the, the work you're, you're planning or dreaming about, I, I caution you to, to let that urge fall away because some of, some of the only reasons that the work I produce today even came about was because someone urged me to keep going and someone said, oh, that's actually really cool or really funny. You should, you should do more of those. And had I just kept them to myself, I probably wouldn't have printed out those cards and placed them on your seat today. So I, I think tapping into this external community of critics or you know, even just your own family or friends uh, can be a really powerful way to inspire you to keep going and tap into your own genius. So another kind of creative duo this idea of tortured lovers. And I won't really go into my history, but there's a couple of famous ones that I think have really had a profound impact on, uh, on our culture. The first one is uh, George O'Keefe and Alfred Stieglitz. And I'm sure you guys all know George O'Keefe. Alfred Stieglitz is um, maybe a little bit lesser known, but he was the he was her much, much older lover and um, really encouraged her from the get-go to explore all of her paintings and uh, to, to be confident in who she was as an artist, which was really invaluable for her. And with all lovers, sometimes it can, you know, things can go sour. And when they did, when he had an affair with a much younger heiress, she found out and decided to just go to Santa Fe and start painting. And I'm sure you all know what came out of that. Uh, some of the most beautiful paintings we have in history. Another tortured lovers gave us two gifts this year alone. I guess lemonade was last year. Uh, <laughs> but what we were getting this peek into the lives of these two amazing artists and seeing their raw pain and how they creatively push each other and how they're inspired by the pain and the, the anguish and the love and everything else that goes along with being a lover can really create these amazing, uh, they can just inspire you in ways that, you know, being in a healthy relationship may not. We're living in a time right now where um, it's really, I think, it's, it's just in, uh, improper to, to be silent. And when, as creators, we have this unique voice and this unique way to maybe spark change and, you know, help sway people's opinions to, to maybe be better. And uh, two, two activists that I think have had a profound impact on American culture um, and their own creative play has been kind of out for public consumption is uh, James Baldwin and Angela Davis. And you may know uh, James Baldwin's open letter to Angela Davis. She was this kind of Marxist revolutionary who on her arrest, uh, Baldwin wrote this incredible open letter to her about the pain of seeing another 
black person in, in handcuffs. And from that, uh, we get his genius, and it was inspired by the, the genius activism of Angela Davis. And these two weren't necessarily, you know, again, they weren't hanging out and actively planning this together. He saw her genius and responded to it in the public in another way. And I think we're seeing a lot more of this because people are finding it harder and harder to stay quiet and harder and harder to accept, you know, what our country is going through today. And so as creatives, I think we have the ability to put stuff out there that is maybe challenging or difficult. Um, and we also have the ability to spark change in others. We don't know that if you know, something we did can inspire someone to be more active in their community or become an activist themselves. My own experience with this um, radically changed my, uh, my own artistic process when during the travel ban in January, um, I went to SFO with a lot of other people to go and protest um, the administration's ban on humans coming into our country. And what I saw there was so many walks of life all doing this very inspiring creative work of just showing up in solidarity. And I went just with a notebook and pen and you know drew them. And what I took away from that was these people who didn't you know, expect to inspire anything except to stand in solidarity actually inspired me to take on a new complete series of, um, of portraits of resistance and portraits of people who were standing up for what they believe in. And I think that that is really beautiful. And all of you guys have you know, that ability too. I, you know, whether it's going and photographing um, different protests or sit-ins or even just going to your local government and bearing witness and documenting what's going on and, and putting that in the public. But you never know like what that would inspire or what that can inspire. The last thing I want to talk about is all of you. So one of the most beautiful things about our age is our ability to connect with anyone in the world. And Mark Zuckerberg is not paying me to say this, but I think that there's something really beautiful about living in such an open and connected world. And when I post something on Instagram, someone in, in Turkey can see it, someone in Australia can see it. And as an artist, like, what more could you possibly want besides letting as many people see your work as possible? And I think that we're sometimes scared to put work out there because we're scared of, you know, being criticized. We're scared of, you know, not being cool enough or it not being good enough. But I think the beauty of a social network is getting feedback and encouragement and uh, just being inspired by other people in your network, too. And um, here we have kind of the first social network, I think, which is Gertrude Stein over here on uh, the left, and her, her buddies, Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald. And you know, she hosted these salons in her apartment, not, not hair salons, but like actual salons where you have a dialogue and you talk and fight and argue about culture and like what it means to be alive. And the, the inspiration that came out of those dialogues is like, you, I don't even think we can possibly begin to understand their impact. But um, we have this today. And it's not sitting in a really chic Parisian salon. It's sitting with our phones and our heads buried in Instagram all day long. Um, so uh, if I could offer you a little piece of advice, um, make that account to post your paintings or your illustrations or your photography or your poetry. Uh, just do it. You know, don't let the fear of being, uh, being labeled as something silly prevent you from, from putting your work out there. And the, the beauty of it is you may inspire someone else to create too. And I think as an artist, there's 
really no greater, greater gift than to be the inspiration for someone else. So in conclusion, I don't think we create alone. <laughs>